I was born in New York City in New York Hospital. One of the few New Yorkers who is actually from New York. My friend Alan Shapolsky used to say that New York attracted the dreamers and nobody in New York is from here, that they all came here to chase their dreams from other places. My biological father, who I'll refer to as my sperm donor dad, was a Navy intelligence officer. And my mother was a talented artist. She was trained, in fact, at the Vancouver School of Fine Arts, and she could draw you so realistically as you stood right before her. She had great detail, like the Russian Impressionists, and she restored art all over the world. Some of the most famous artists, she restored their artwork, and also in some of the most famous museums. But it was about impossible to make any money doing this, so she became a waitress, which is where she met my father and later worked in retail selling clothes and china and silverware. My sperm donor dad had a brother who was a librarian his entire life. He was also homosexual and lived in Greenwich Village. And we'd see him from time to time, and he and my father were very close, despite my sperm donor dad abhorring homosexuals. My mother and sperm donor met in a bar that he ran in the 60s and 70s called Hand Ratties on 95th Street and Amsterdam Avenue in Manhattan. My sperm donor dad explained to me that when he was in the Navy, he was stationed on the USS Kidd, a destroyer during the Cuban Missile Crisis. And one day the warship was in dry dock in Boston and the Navy brass arrived, assembled the men and told them, Call your mommies, call your girlfriends, call your wives, and say goodbye. The United States and Russia are about to go at it with nuclear weapons. It's the end of the world. And we ship out for Cuba first thing in the morning. He told me that the kid was an auxiliary launch station for nuclear weapons strapped to submarines. In other words, to launch a nuclear weapon from a sub, you needed two other ships holding down the red launch button simultaneously. And he told me that when they got to the Caribbean, they were stationed off the coast of Santo Domingo, and President Kennedy got on the radio, and they assembled in the control room, and he spoke to them. And he said, boys, this is the president. I want you to know that if I give the order, I'm ready to go. Sperm donor dad told me this history about 50 times growing up, and he always added a statement to the end of this story that Cuba did have nuclear weapons inside the island and that the plan was to attempt to level Cuba into the Caribbean Sea. Wow. My sperm donor father was also a loan shark in the Navy. He explained to me that the mafia at the time ran the ports in New York and that the kid, his ship, docked in the harbor here. He was a mounted of a man about six foot four, two hundred and fifty pounds, and was given a sum of money each time the ship got to port, and he'd loan it out to the officers going on leave. Of course, all these guys wanted to see New York and party, and three hundred dollars was a lot of money back in these days, so it was expected they would repay the money and the interest, the VIG, when they got their commissions every month from the Navy. The penalty for not paying when the money came due was my sperm donor dad would not issue you a shore pass and you had to stay on the ship while the others went out and partied. My father told me that only one time did somebody not pay back his loan and that he made him mop the deck of the kid in his underwear in New York Harbor. When he got out of the Navy, he took his motorcycle and shipped it to Europe and spent, I think, half a year there riding through Europe on the bike. Sperm donor dad was a very, very capable and intelligent person with tremendous hands-on experience in the most important areas futuristically. He was a telecommunications expert who told me that the first computer he ever placed his hands on was the size of a garage, and that was in 1959. When he returned to New York, he had a host of jobs, but notably he worked in New Jersey, where he was from, hanging telephone cables for Ma Bell, then called 9X. And yes, they were a government-owned private company, a monopoly. So sperm donor dad worked climbing up wooden poles and assembling the Ma Bell cables. And according to him, once in a while, they would have to use a helicopter 
to go up with a specially made plastic pole that disconnected and reconnected these cables and uh, could even cut and reassemble them, splicing them back together if need be. He'd walk around New York with a big telephone headset that had two cables attached to it with alligator clips on both ends. The earpiece of the headset had a special keyboard on the back side, just numbers and some function keys, and he could go up to any one of a number of what were called switchboard boxes that were on the streets, somewhere in basements of buildings, and plug in this device and listen to any phone call being made in the neighborhood. In fact, he showed me once in the basement of the apartment that we grew up in how he could listen to all of my mother's phone calls. One day he took me to a rough neighborhood, may have been near the Bronx Zoo, I really don't remember, and he plugged into one of these switchboard boxes on the street corner and told me, I want you to go ahead and have a listen. As a kid, this was the most boring thing in the world to me, I remember. I said, I don't want to hear this, it's boring. But he insisted, and what I heard was a conversation with these crazy ghetto people about all sorts of nonsense, swearing and cursing. I remember some woman telling her husband or boyfriend or whatever he was that she was sucking another man's dick and people yelling, cursing. And my sperm donor father told me he wanted me to hear this and that I should know that most people are completely crazy and this is what I should come to expect from people when I grow up. He used the words, they'll fight to the death over ridiculous nonsense. Sperm donor dad then walked around the ghetto and pointed to some of the vagrants telling me, see that woman? She's a prostitute. See that one? That's a heroin addict. You can tell because their teeth are missing and so on and so forth. See that man? He's a pimp. See him? He's a dealer. He told me it was just as important to see the bad side as it was to see the good side of people. Sperm donor dad really did not like people in general. He was very adamant to instill in me his belief that, quote, people are basically stupid, unquote. Sperm donor dad had computers and was on the internet before it was the internet, back when it was called the bulletin board system or BBS. I remember he had an Atari computer with two monitors, one to send a message on and another to receive it on. He had, if memory serves me correctly, a 7.2 megabit per second modem. He'd often do his telecommunications work from home, and he'd draw out for me charts that explained how data moved and computers talked to one another. Sperm donor dad would tell me all the time that the government, and he meant the United States and Canada, he was adamant that they were one and the same, utilized the North American Aerospace Defense Command, or NORAD, to record every single landline telephone call in North America on a network of giant digital cassettes that held thousands of hours of audio at reduced speeds. He claimed the government housed these tapes in operation centers throughout the country and that there were multiple substations that straddled incoming and outgoing calls and digitized a version of each one, feeding the signal to the closest operation center. He claimed to have worked in one of these operation centers for a few days and said it was inside of a mountain. He claimed the government had been doing this since the 1960s and that private industry was heavily involved in this. He also told me that all phone calls made to the United States from other countries were given high priority for monitoring with a three-second delay as they occurred, using a combination of both human operations and a special digital listening device that detected words like Russia, bomb, nuclear, etc., and notified the operator assigned to the line when a keyword triggered this system. He explained in great zest to me that this program was based on the digital conversion of analog data and that the government had achieved this many, many years before the public understood what digital data was. The public only began to get a concept of what digital data was, he said, through the advent of special effects in movies. Sperm donor dad had one of the very first cell phones I ever saw. I remember he carried it around in a large box that had handles on it like a suitcase. When he first showed it to me, we were in Coney Island, Brooklyn, back when the place was practically falling apart. I mean, rides were abandoned, others were rusting, and people would offer my father drugs and hookers as we walked through the place. He pulled out the cell phone and said, call your mother. 
She answered her phone and she was confused. She went looking into the living room to see if we were in the house. She said, I thought you guys were outside. When I told her I was outside and on a phone that had no cords or cables, she didn't believe it. But despite all of my sperm donor dad's experience and intelligence, like most geniuses, he walked a thin line between brilliance and insanity, clarity and life's many addictions. He held a dark side to him that involved riding in a motorcycle gang, washing money for drug dealers, and eventually having a price on his head in New York. Next time on This Man's Amazing Life. Sperm Donor Dad read some bars in Manhattan, bars back then were the connection between the streets and the penthouse suites. Behind the bars sat the safes. From time to time, Sperm Donor Dad would have to regulate the criminals that operated in the bar. The pimp began to get a little too comfortable in the bar. Sperm Donor Dad's time running bars came to an end when he ran cross with a Cuban drug dealer pushing heroin. I don't know what Sperm Donor Dad was thinking, I know he worked as an enforcer from time to time, but he gave this man a beating in front of his clients. Sperm Donor Dad rode in a biker gang. He had tattoos from the neck down and a lot of them were of snakes pulling him strangely to hell. He had a tattoo I always found interesting, it was of his ex-wife crucified. I asked the man one day why he had those axes on his bike. He told me that if he got into a fight and had to use a weapon, he wanted to use one that had another purpose so you can't be charged with intentional murder. Growing up in New York City is an experience like none other and I think I should lay some real heavy rap on you brothers and sisters right now and give you the straight scoop on a few things about being a kid in the metropolis of NYC. Please be sure to subscribe and keep up with this amazing life. Oh, my God.